Hmm. So we see a, a really interesting example of uh, the early church in Jerusalem. Um, Christ gives them some warning and uh, sure enough, this withdrawal happens and the Christians at that time fled off to beyond the Jordan River. And to a large degree, they, um, they uh, uh, well, avoid the calamity that took place. So my question to you this morning is, is that as, as Christians and as Seventh-day Adventists that have a message of the end time, do we uh, perceive that we as um, uh, God's people are going to be faced with a lot of persecution? Yes. Janice, that's not good news. <laughs> So, so you're going to have to, to, to speak loudly. There's a couple of young ladies behind you that are struggling with hearing, and I, I can relate to them. So I just, just, just think of me as one of your annoying young kids and talk loudly to them. <laughs> anyway, it's just, you know what, basically there are two paths. Hmm. And we can choose which path we want to take. Okay. But down the road, it's going to be really rough, too. And I'd rather be on the path, the rough path with Jesus by my side than on the other path. Because a sentence that, can I just read? Sure, yes, sentence? please, yes. So, t tell us what, what jumps out on you when you read that. What's the take-home message on it? So uh, just to further that, Jesus makes a comment, you're no greater than the master, and if they treated me like this, don't be surprised if they treat you like that. Brady, I'm so glad you're here this morning. I want you to know that as, as a, uh, yeah, a young Seventh-day Adventist, <laughs> we're going we're gonna to use that term here. I want you to take this take-home message to your friends and family that, you know what, there's going to be persecution, and it's going to be bad, and it's going to be terrible, but if you stay close to Jesus, you'll get beat up, pounded on, uh, and you will somehow uh, maybe bleed out to death, but that's okay, but it's, just all, it's all right because you're going to go to heaven. <laughs> is is that is that really the exciting good news? This is I'm just picking up here what these uh, dear uh, ladies have said. I'm just summarizing it. But but Jesus is going to be with you, so it's going to be okay as you die. <laughs>
message. I'm going to warn you, this is what's going to happen. But that's not the first message he gave. Mm. What was his purpose? His purpose was to show what God is like. And God is a loving God. Okay. And this was not his original plan. Yeah, okay. Yes, Brady. <laughs> <laughs> At the end times, that stuff is going to happen to everybody, no matter what. Ah. And, and when, you're, when you're devoted to Jesus, you hmm. need comfort in the end that it's not going to be the end. Okay. So, yes, in the end times, you are going to suffer. You're, it's gonna, this is going to happen to everybody. Yeah. But yeah. you're going to be okay. And as a Christian, you get comfort in that, that Jesus is real. Jesus okay. Is so you're you're gonna die along with your your friends, but you'll die happy. They'll die miserable. Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> with hope is what. Yes, yeah. The thing is, he knows that that's not the end. Ah, okay. So, <clears throat> so that's that's good. So. And God's not the problem. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Exactly. So, um, they die in despair. You die in hope. <laughs> Yeah. That's very true. Yeah. Yeah. Pastor Dirk and then, or uh, Hilaire. Then, uh, uh, yeah. I do like this last little paragraph on Monday. Um, <clears throat> sets Jumbo in, in vain, Mercedes Tucker Street. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. In vain, Mercedes Tucker Street destroyed the Church of Christ by violence. The great controversy in which the disciples of Jesus yielded up their lives did not cease when these faithful stand bearers fell by the cross. By defeat, they conquered. Hmm. That, I thought, was... I underlined that, too. Yeah. yeah. God's workmen were slain, but his works went steadily forward. Huh. Um, so, <laughs> it's like fertilizer, the blood of the saints. Yes, or, or, yeah, the seeds for the... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Pastor Dirk, help us out here. Excellent. But there is. Maybe not right here, right now. Mm. Um, there are lots of persecution against Christians in this world going on right now. Okay. And we're probably 99% oblivious to it. Yep. Even aware. Yep. Yep. For example, in India, in the last few years, there have been a number of laws passed that are. Hmm. Even though Hinduism in India is not an ofi- the official state religion. Interesting, yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> it is right now very difficult for Christians from outside of India to go into India mm. in any kind of missionary group. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the banned mich- missionaries, essentially, yeah. Yeah. Send money into India to help the Christian there. Use Bitcoin. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm to yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. It's difficult. It is. It's very difficult. Um, in many parts of Africa, right now, there are Seventh day Adventist gospel outreach Bible agents in prison. Wow. So, so if I if I understand what you're implying here is is that persecution is happening globally, <clears throat> even though where we are we're insulated to of it. So we're kind of we we can take um, uh, uh, solace in this uh, text, and yes, persecution will happen even though we're not experiencing it. Can I invite you to turn to the Book of Revelation? <clears throat> I'm getting excited about the Book of Revelation lately here. And if I could have you go to, I think, I think if I get it correctly, Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. Jordan, you have a lovely reading voice. 
and um, your underused talent. I'm wondering if you could um, read that for us here. Uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, and I think I got it correctly here. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. Fantastic. <clears throat> so, that is really a really interesting verse. Could you go back to where it talks about ten days? You could just reread that again. Uh, indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Okay, so, as, as uh, wonderful Seventh-day Adventists, we have an understanding of the day-year prophecy, an understanding of that. So, Pastor Dirk, just to make sure I don't go off the rails, you've, in Revelation, we typically extrapolate one day for one year. Would you agree with that? <clears throat> so we as a church often take A.D. 538, I think it is, and we will say, you know what, that is the beginning of the tribulation that they experienced, and then for a thousand years, or ten days, a thousand years, and there's no question, historically, the, the Christian church was, was brutalized. Oh, okay, fantastic. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, but but basically, around the time the French Revolution ends is or starts and ends, there's about a three-year period that is historically. My understanding is that when uh, Bible scholars say that is probably the end of this ten-day period, and that it comes in. Because immediately after that, within three or four years of the uh, French Revolution, you have the Bible societies, you have uh, the Dutch Reform organizations, and, and you have the, the, the coming back of Christianity. So, I am intrigued by this. So this morning, um, I want to go uh, back to my sister's reading skills. And I'm going to ask you to join with her and follow along on Thursdays. I'm going to ask you to read again, Hilaire, if you would. And I'm, what I want to do is set this thing up here because this, this, this to me was a really an interesting breakthrough in my understanding. Because <clears throat> for me, I must say, I had a very um, uh, typical, and I say typical, understanding that uh, we are going to go through this really ugly, uh, brutalizing experience. I'm not saying people aren't, but I'm just saying is that the Christian community in general are going to do that. So, Blair, if you could pick this up on Thursday, the second paragraph, one of the greatest revelations of God's love was the demonstration when... One of the greatest revelations of God's love was demonstrated when two devastating pandemics plagued the early centuries around Fantastic. Okay. So I want to I want to just stop right there. So what what I'm coming to is is that for me, I thought that was really useful. There was some value in all this death and suffering because it was it spawned interest. It created uh, uh, an understanding of what Christianity was 
and in turn, as you used the term earlier, it was the seeds that grew in that part of the world, and as in the seeds is in Christian seeds. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we had millions. So <clears throat> what what I'm coming to is is that God used this calamity to create some value. So I'm going to go over here on this side of the ship for a minute here. This is a, this is a this is a gospel ship. I just want you to know this morning. <laughs> So what, what, what is being said here is we have this brutality, we see what's going on, and ultimately, if you read down there, the, the Christians were very involved with helping with the plagues and taking care of people, and they suffered losses because of their willingness to go in and help people that were dying. So you have, you have two death causes. One is the brutality of the people, and one is as a result of their kindness going in and helping, and they in turn died from it. So you have two reasons why people were dying. And with that, as Janice pointed out, millions of people came into contact with, with Christianity. That has value to it. To me, that makes sense. So... Oh no. Yeah, so, so I, I, and that's a really important point and a very powerful one. And Oza, I'm so glad you're, you're here this morning because I, I got a question here for everybody. So what, what we're just ex looking at is, is that the early church, early Christian church, just bring, bring you up to speed because this, this, is, this is important that you can, because you're going to need to help us here. The early Christian church dealt with a lot of uh, suffering, persecution, and ultimately, because of the acts of kindness, they also um, experienced huge losses in their community because of their willingness to go and help people who were dying. And the result is, and to use this phrase that Hilaire has referred to, their blood became seeds. A mind-blowing concept that blood turns into seeds. But it, it's an idea that their death, their sacrifice was a tremendous influence for good and people were in intrigued and inspired and wanted to know more and ultimately became uh, associated with and became Christians themselves. So there was value in their death, even though they didn't see it. Jordan has pointed out a really important point just now is that they died with the hope of the, the resurrection. So. Fear not. Yes. Fear not. So what the, what the thinking is here this morning, and I want to challenge this idea, that we're going to face a similar situation with all this uh, brutality and persecution and, and tragedy. And Pastor Dirk has pointed out a really good point that there is, around the world, people that are experiencing pockets of, I say pockets, it's not... Yeah, there are people in prison right now, too, and uh, i got to be really clear. It doesn't help the person in prison and say, well, there's 100 other people. Be happy that you're in prison. They're still experiencing pain and agony. So there's people that are experiencing this, and we appreciate that. But it doesn't 
we don't see at this point in time this wholesale persecution of Christians happening right now globally. Uh, and and that, that could be debated. So what I'm coming to is, is that if we look at the, the agenda that I see in Revelation, is, is that now we have a whole bunch of people just before Christ's return that are suffering, that are being persecuted, being beat on, and they're dying. They die with a happy hope. And now their, their blood falls on the street and Jesus comes. What value did that do? Ozone, we need your help. So I'm going to go back on this side of the boat here. So what I'm saying is, is that shouldn't the death of a martyr have as much value today as it did back then? Sorry? Who says it doesn't? Well, it, if, if, if there's no seed from their blood, then it's just death. I'm saying is, is that the early martyrs had seed value. Their blood was seed value. Their life was seed value. Here, there's no seed value. This, this just resonates with me, the seed idea. Yes, uh, uh, Nicole? Sorry, you gotta you gotta speak up because Hilaire, Hilaire's deaf. And this tree got seeded blood on the stuff, but Yeah, I know it's a confusing idea. Excellent. Even now. <clears throat> Even now. Obviously, we're still discussing the martyrs of today, right now. So, I mean, it doesn't have millions, but it could touch someone who does touch millions. Okay, so there, so there is, the, and, and, and rightly so. And you, your good point, you make a very valid point, is is that that we don't know what the life's the ramifications are. If the person dies t uh, tomorrow or the next day, um, because yeah, yes, Jordan. Well, that's right. Yeah. No. That's that's. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that is 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 a critical point, even though God had the power and the capacity to prevent that tragedy from happening. He chose not to, but it wasn't initiated by him. I mean, we, we can get a hold on to the discussion on that one. <clears throat> so I'm back to this one here. Is everybody sure that what's on the agenda is trials, tribulation, and persecution, and death? So I'm going to challenge you on that because I, I'm not so sure that the persecution that is referred to in the Dark Ages is a, a thousand year period where they put them on the racks and did whatever else to them is on the schedule for Christians at the end time. Because as using Nicole's comment here in her verse that God is going to create something good out of it. So, in the timeline of God, it takes a, um, a seed, I know this idea really well, the seed has to be immersed, immersed into soil and water and we stir that up, and then there is time for that thing to germinate, time for it to produce results. <clears throat> Much like our 
our experience when we first initiate some or, or immerse somebody into Christianity, it takes time for them to get the concept and appreciate and become a Christian. So, if this person is dying today, we can expect that their life work would have some influence, and that would take a while and would grow, and ultimately, ozone would be inspired and become a Christian. Glad that worked out for you, ozone. <laughs> so, what I'm saying is, is that if Christ comes here and the guy dies there, there's no, there's no time, there's no value for, for that to happen. I'm arguing that there is no need for Christians to be persecuted and die at or close to the time of Christ's return. Sorry? Yeah. So, yeah. So, so <laughs> that bothers me because then we <laughs> then we excuse we excuse God by saying, "Oh, well, we're in a war." So we give him a doorway to get out. <laughs> Not that he needs my doorway. <laughs> that sounds so arrogant when I let it out of my mouth, but. <laughs> But what I'm coming to is, is that what is happening here doesn't make sense. So let me tell you what my experience was. <clears throat> so this morning here, I was struggling with this. And I get out um, um, early, uh, early writings. The book, Ellen White, first book that I think she produced was early writings. And I start reading through there, and I was interested to see what her thoughts were on it. And I will be the first to admit that we need to get our faith and our understanding from the Bible first. And then we add this uh, icing on top of the cake. And I've, I read this through this morning. So something's not, not adding up. When I read her material, uh, it clicked for me. She points out that number one is, is that the Christians are going to be dealing with Despair, and on our text here this morning talks about disappointment, heartache, struggling with their faith. But nowhere does she say that they're going to be in wholesale manner put on the racks and beaten, persecuted as in physical form. She actually implies that there's no need for that but they will be dealing with a time of trouble as in their, in, their, in their thinking and in their understanding and in their relationship to others and their relationship to their church and their relationship to God, but the actual physical abuse that we saw taking place in the 1,000 year period, the Dark Ages, doesn't seem to be um, put in there and applied in the last day because the death of that person has really very little value. So, the good news is, ozone, you're not going to go on the racks. <laughs> yes. I have a question. Yes. Sorry, we're talking about time line. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. And they get they. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If they get raptured off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get vacuum. All the good guys up. Hmm. So, what I hear you saying is that the good people are either going to die. <clears throat> Again, let's use the word translated. We don't want to use rapture. That's not a very good Adventist word. They're going to get translated, but they're not going to be around. So all just 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 bad people doing bad things to bad people. Fant I like that idea. Not not. <laughs> I don't know if we can support that biblically, but I like that idea. <laughs> Pastor Dirk, yeah. Um, it's an issue raises an important point as far as the personal. 
Yes. Uh, have I confessed all of my sins? Mm. Uh, have I made it right with this person? Have I made it right with that person? But especially, have I made it right with God? Mm. Mm. And then that's some of the agony. That's not to excuse yes. some of the physical persecution that comes with that. But I think that's where uh, you know, the illustration that Yes. I'm sure that Joseph wouldn't have said that when he was sold by his brothers. Yep. Yep. No, only afterwards did he say that. Afterwards. Yeah. At what point in time he came to that conclusion, the Bible doesn't tell us. Hmm. I mean, you know, he was still in prison because of being falsely accused by Potiphar's wife. Yep. Hmm. He probably, again, this is conjecture, but he began to realize that. Mm. As long as he was faithful to God, God would work out something good out of it. I mean, we have no idea what Joseph's life, what kind of a testimony it was to Potiphar and his family. That's true. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. For exa other example, we have no idea what Paul's influence was when he was a prisoner in Rome. Mm. The influence that he had, uh, you know, the Bible tells us that even some of Caesar's household yeah. became Christian. That's fantastic, yeah. Was that because of Paul being a prisoner? Was it because of Paul was probably being a prisoner and talking? Because <laughs> yeah, there was lots of prisoners around there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, Paul was not one that you were going to shut down. <laughs> you know, he Mm. And still witness. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Uh, not just back then, but even today, and even in that short period of time that the Bible refers to as the time of trouble. Yes. But you know, in, in my mind, we have, we have to also keep in mind the timeline because there's two agendas going on right now, and it will be going on. One is Satan's agenda, mm. which is to destroy as many people's faith in the true God as he possibly can, any way that he can do it. Yeah, seek and uh, uh, deceive and, and destroy. The other agenda is the agenda of God and Jesus. Mm. And to seek and to save as many as could possibly be saved. Yep, yes, you have the two counters, so, yeah. Hmm. And I can choose which agenda I want to be a part of. Yes. Yep. And then, as was mentioned earlier, then when I am persecuted, even when I'm ready to have my head chopped off, hmm. I have the promise of the, well, I guess you can call it a promise, the promise that my death will be only the first death. Yes. Yep. Yeah, no, I, 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 very interesting insight. Janice, you had an a insight there that I, I'm interested in hearing you comment on. It's a little different than that. Oh, that good. We're talking, <laughs> we're talking about persecution here. Yes. Basically, and that is different than, I just, you know what, I know people that are suffering disease that doesn't look like a good outcome. That's right. Were you wearing a mask? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we met a fellow from town. He was also, he would bring his dog up there and walk often. We met him often. Anyway, this one day, he was so full of fear because of mm. COVID. Mm. And we were just able, you know, to talk to him. And I, you know, the 
So you, you made a really interesting point, and your, your husband made a couple of really great points also. The, the idea that your husband commented on is, is that, that our intellectual um, connection with Jesus is, is a paramount in how we can relate to the world around us. If that's in question, then we have difficulty relating to others and dealing with their own issues. The other one that, Janice, I think you really made an interesting point is that we talk about uh, pain and suffering in the way of persecution. So over on this side of the boat here, I'm curious here. When a person experiences pain, does it really matter if it's coming from a disease or something a person inflicted on you? Is, does, the, does the brain register pain differently? It does. No, 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 let's say both physical. One is, is that, let's say, let's say that I have cancer and I am dealing with a very pain, painful type of cancer and I'm in a lot of physical pain. And then I'm over here and ozone has me on the racks and I'm being persecuted by ozone and I'm experiencing physical pain. In my brain, at the this, at this cellular level, no, it doesn't make any difference. So pain is pain, no matter how it's generated by uh, disease, etc. So what you're saying is, is that we can actually have persecution from disease, from sin, but that is not generated by a bad person, but by, well, sorry, by, yeah, it is a bad person, Satan, but I'm just saying it's not like you're on the rack. So, so I think there's a difference in the way we relate to it. That's true, we do relate to it, but the actual feeling of it. So, okay, so, so that's a very powerful point. As, as we move towards, um, as time moves forward, diseases historically have accelerated, problems have, uh, from a physical point of view have accelerated so we can have a greater portion of the population experiencing physical pain even though they may not be on the racks. Ken, I'm really glad you came here to help us out. So what I'm coming to, what I'm coming to is, is that uh, if, if, if my interpretation and understanding of the works of Ellen White is correct, then the physical idea that going that we as Christians are going to end up in the racks is probably off the agenda. Not saying that there isn't going to be places and people that are, are experiencing it, but you're not going to see the brutality that we saw in the Dark Ages. What we are going to be faced with, as Pastor Dirk has highlighted, is that as we have seen all these things collapse around us, then our faith in Jesus becomes paramount in how we relate to it. Um, Hilary, you referred to this idea in one of the, the, the paragraph that you read there, and there's an interesting concept, is how do we understand success? I'm gonna extrapolate that from. We, today, understand success as a big bank account, a big car, uh, big hair, big teeth, um, <laughs> you know, all those good things, right? We have, it's, it's all about stuff. And then we say we are successful. If you take, if you take that example of what Hilaire was talking about and saying that heaven's perspective of a success is different than the worldly concept of success. So a successful person in heaven's eyes isn't somebody that has big hair and a big bank account. Now I can say that because I don't have much. Ozone, you gotta be careful because you got a lot of hair. <laughs> so what, what I'm trying to say is, is that when we look at it and we redefine success, then how do we maintain that? So if that's the case, so Rachel, I need your help on this one. 
if you were going to give me some advice and say, Greg, you are going to go into a very stressful situation. Um, the situations in your life are going to be uh, challenging. You're going to deal with uh, despair, disappointment, uh, heartache. Uh, you're going to have um, uh, people that will uh, give you um, poor information about who you are and your relationship with God. All these things are going to come to you. But you're going to give me advice and say, hey, you need to maintain your relationship with God. What advice would you give me? You're welcome to get your husband's input on it. Is there anything that I can do <clears throat> going into it? What I'm trying to say is, is that uh, I'm very, very happy to tell you this story. Sometimes I, I got to gloat. Ken, I think you will appreciate this. And Pastor Dirk, I know you've all... I started getting firewood cut and in place last week for the winter coming up. That, to me, is very forward thinking. <laughs> so what I'm coming to you is, is that if, if you were to say to me, winter is coming, Greg, even though it's getting hotter and hotter every day, I would say, well, that's not likely, but you sure it is. So I'm putting wood in place for when it's going to get cold. What I'm asking and for your thoughts this morning is, is that what advice would you give me as a, uh, a young Christian, a mature Christian, that says, okay, all this stuff is going to happen to you when you get here. You're going to have disappointment. You're going to have all this grief. Uh, but you probably won't end up on the racks. But you're going to be, end up all these other things. What would you recommend I do? <clears throat> Memorize the Bible. Uh, put Ellen White's work on a microchip. What, what would you... Uh, any, anything... I like the direction you pointed us. That's, that's fantastic. So it comes down to my daily activity. J Jordan. In the book, Early Writings, um, uh, which I read this morning, so, so proud I can say this. Um, she talks about a cord, a green cord. Anybody remember that? This is a green cord. Green cord, of course, resonates with me. This, this is, when I see something green, I know it's alive. So it's like, yes, this, this is a live cord, is what I'm trying to say. How do you grow, how do you grow something? Julie, you know all this really well about growing things. How do you grow something? And then you call your husband. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Nicole, you're, you know how to grow things. Your mom does too, but she's, she's, she's not <laughs> giving me very good information this morning. <laughs> Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So, community is important. Small stress is important. Picking up what Rachel said, the joy uh, of, of living the Christian life, being able to deal with uh, situations and, and still move through it. Do we have uh, th this? This you guys are on the right track. I, I love this. So what, what else, what can we do to grow our cord? Because what I'm coming to, what, I'm, what I understand is, is that the people that are going to make it through the time of trouble and the end time are those that have a green cord. And some have larger, some have smaller, but they all have a cord. And going back to that, Pastor Dirk has mentioned um, you know, the stresses the, that are going to be attacking them, as Nicole has pointed out. So you have these psychological, well, yeah, psychological stresses that have been defined by Pastor Dirk. You got this. Auntie, I need your help. Yeah. How, um, let, me, let me back up. You use this thing on the, if, if you want me to grow, because you had me when I was a little kid, or you, you were around me when I was a little kid. If I sat in my high chair thing, stool, or whatever it was, and you watched Hilaire shove food into my mouth, and I didn't do anything except eat, 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 what would you say? <laughs> I get, I wouldn't, I wouldn't work out very well, would I? You know, I'd break the chair pretty soon. <laughs> so when you, when you're, well, I'm using this for example. So when you have a person, you want them to put food in them and you want them to release the energy by running around or going outside. And my mother's just go outside and play outside, Greg. Enough of you in here. And, and, uh, Many of my relatives said the same thing, and even today, just go inside for a while, I can't deal with you. So what I'm coming to is, is that we need to have a release of energy. Pastor Dirk made a really interesting comment about the, past, or, or the Apostle Paul. While he was in prison, you finish off the sentence, he was, he was just sitting there doing... So he was releasing, he was releasing information about who this amazing God is. So when I go back to it, the way to grow a Christian is to have them absorb energy and release energy. So for me to become a big, strong Christian, <laughs> Like Paul, I need to do one. Like Rachel's comment, live it, have joy in what we're doing, even though we have difficulties. Nicole has pointed out that we have some stresses. Anna Maria said I should release some of this energy outside. <laughs> Yes. 
Uh huh. And then I have something to be joyful for. Joyful for the persecution? Probably not. Mm. But joyful for the one who gives me strength. Yep. And yeah. fills me with joy in spite of the adversity. And the hope is that hopefully at some point you'll be a child of enough wisdom to make stuff that won't make you rubbish. I don't like sharing. <laughs> <laughs> it isn't working in angles here. Yeah, putting me on this spot. Yeah, it's, it's Sabbath morning. I have to share. Yes, but uh, the, the, no. Your your point is is that that is really a powerful one, and I think is a very good one, and I think is one that we need to end on. One is is that I using this the the wood pile has to be something that that I have that I can share. When sharing, I release understanding and information. And that, in turn, grows me. That is, from my understanding, is, is when your cord gets bigger is when you are sharing. So if you, want to, if you want to get strong, you have to get rid of it. Interesting concept. You have to release it to get more. Because if I don't pass on the wood, that wood pile yeah. rot. Yeah, I know. Sorry. I know, I don't want to get too much and have that. That's my... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, 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 I agree with you. So wh what, I'm, what I'm encouraging you to, to think about today is, number one is, is that this idea of going on the racks and going to get beat up and pulverized and then die, it, it, it certainly not without that possibility. But what I'm also saying is, is that the the probability is minimal on that, but the probability is very high that your faith is going to be tested. You're going to hit discouraging times. You're going to do all these things that, <clears throat> when we read in our text here this morning, it says, number one, fear not. You're going to be dealing with fear. I am with you. And if you have the most powerful force in the universe with you, who can be against you? And if you have that joy of Jesus that we referred to, like Rachel talked about, and all these things that Pastor Dirk said is probably going to hit us, then, based on what Anna Marie said, we should get active and release it to get more. And by, by releasing things, I get strong. Ozone knows all about this. He goes beats on something. He has, he says, sometimes he gets a very nice young man in a corner and just pulverizes him. <laughs> he gives him some padding, so it's not all bad. And, and then they talk about it afterwards. But what I'm saying is, is that he gets stronger by pounding on this guy. The poor guy gets weaker by absorbing it. <laughs> But what, I, what I'm trying to say is, is that it is by him releasing it. Sorry, Oza, I'm almost ready to apologize to you. <laughs> by releasing energy, he gets stronger. By releasing what we know about God, by sharing what the love of God is in our life to those people around us, we in turn are able to withstand all the challenges and the difficulties that didn't come our place. Yes, there is going to be physical pain, and I think I would ar support what, what is being said here that we may not have the racks, but we're going to have disease. We may have a lot of these other things, but we're going to be faced with still pain. We're going to be faced with discouragement. But our God is with us. And what an amazing God we have. Let's stop this thing here before I get on my second wind. <laughs> Heavenly Father, 
you have gone to the cross for us, so we don't necessarily have to go to the cross. We want to pray for our brothers and sisters that are in the, carrying their cross right now. But this morning we get to live in this little wonderful greenhouse in Asuyas. And we get to have the values and the benefits that each one of us share. We get to enjoy <clears throat> hearing you speak to us through music, through song, through one another. And so today, Lord, we just ask that you will grow us. Give us an opportunity to share who you are with our friends and neighbors. And may someday, may someday soon, we sit at your feet with all our loved ones and with all our dear ones and with our neighbors and our friends here in Asuyas. We pray this in the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen.